Well, after 15 years of, of um, work on the CEDAW committee and dealing with uh, uh, issues around women in a very comprehensive manner, taking up the, the position of special representative of the Secretary General uh, on sexual violence in, in, uh, in conflict, is uh, extremely linked, is, is my CEDAW experience. I bring my CEDAW experience to this mandate uh, in terms of the added value uh, uh, of, of the mandate. Uh, my, my priority really is to ensure that uh, conflict-related sexual violence is not looked at in, in isolation. Um, and having followed this mandate since its establishment, uh, I have the feeling that to a certain extent uh, it has been very much uh, addressed as, okay, this is my, this is the, it's true that it is a Security Council mandate and uh, the two previous SRSGs had to be very focused, disciplined and pragmatic in terms of uh, um, uh, ensuring that they, they work within the parameters of the mandate. But I think after, after seven years uh, down the road, I think it's important uh, to really address the root cause. Uh, and I think my appointment uh, comes at a at the right time in terms of uh, having also uh, working with a new Secretary General, so being the special representative uh, of a new Secretary General, who the first thing that he said when he was appointed, and he really means it, is that prevention is not a priority, but prevention is the priority. And I'm very much in line with the vision of the Secretary General to the extent that for me, uh, we have to address uh, the root cause uh, of sexual violence. We have to address gender inequality and discrimination, which is the invisible driver of conflict-related sexual violence. So I see this as one of my <coughs> strategic priorities for this mandate. I also think that uh, the face of this mandate uh, is that of a survivor, a woman, a girl, because they are significantly impacted by conflict-related sexual violence, but also men and boys. Uh, and I am very determined to take a, a survivor-centered approach, a human rights-based approach. And in terms of uh, the response that is uh, that my mandate requires me to uh, uh, to, to bring to, uh, to the survivors in terms of the strategic uh, and coherent leadership that I have to, uh, uh, to, to, to bring to this mandate. I think it's extremely uh, important to be very comprehensive. Uh, so that's, that's the survivor-centered uh, approach. And for me, the, the whole question uh, around prevention is, uh, this, this is a mandate that has done a lot, in, in, it's a young mandate, seven years has done a lot uh, in terms of, of the advocacy, in terms of uh, uh, today, I think it's generally accepted that sexual violence is not uh, 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 an inevitable byproduct of war, it's not uh, uh, mere collateral damage, uh, it, it is increasingly recognized as a tactic of, of war, as a tactic of terrorism, uh, which, which really needs to be, uh, to be addressed uh, as such. Uh, and I think since Resolution 1888, there has been many other resolutions of the Council that has also, to a certain extent, uh, reinforce the mandate. For example, uh, for the first time in, in December 2016 with Resolution 2331, the Security Council has seen the nexus between sexual violence in conflict and, 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 and trafficking. Uh, 
uh, which led the office to also redefine uh, conflict-related sexual violence to include, uh, to include trafficking. The, uh, the office uh, is composed of, of uh, uh, a, a team focusing on the programs. We have a team of experts on, on the rule of law that, that provides technical support to, uh, to member states, uh, uh, building their capaci the capacity of their security or their, or their uh, justice sector. Uh, and I also, there's also UN Action Network, and I have a, 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 a coordinator uh, that ensures that the UN Action Network uh, on uh, conflict-related sexual violence, which is a network of 13 UN entities delivering as one, and very soon it's going to be 14. IOM is joining uh, the, the network. Uh, is also an important vehicle uh, in terms of the responses that we uh, we, we extend, uh, support that we extend to survivors, but also directly to uh, to member states. Uh, so. Despite everything that has been done, uh, and a, a lot has been achieved in a short while, I want to bring the focus very much on justice and accountability. I, I, I think this is, this is critical. I think uh, that uh, justice and peace are mutually reinforcing. Uh, I think, uh, and, and also uh, since I took up office in, in June, uh, I have met, I have made it a point to, to, uh, to uh, go out and, and, and reach out and, and listen firsthand to survivors. Uh, I have met with Yazidi survivors uh, <coughs> of uh, sexual violence uh, from, from uh, Daesh uh, captivity. I have met with uh, uh, the Chibok girls. Uh, I have met with other survivors of sexual violence by Boko Haram. I went to visit a camp, one of the largest camp in no northeast Nigeria in Maiduguri. I have reached out to uh, visit a, a large camp in uh, eastern DRC in Goma. I have uh, met with survivors of sexual violence in Bosnia, who 25 years later are still claiming justice. Uh, and more recently, uh, two weeks ago, I was in uh, Cox's Bazaar, and I met with the survivors of sexual violence, those who have fled Myanmar and have crossed the border into, into, into Bangladesh. And listening to these survivors and, and, and uh, uh, seeing their thirst for, for, for justice, uh, during, uh, since I, I took up this mandate, I mean, they have helped me uh, a lot in shaping my own priorities, and I want to place the focus very much on justice and accountability in terms of uh, building capacity of states, but also ensuring that it results in, uh, in consistent prosecutions and uh, c convictions. Well, indeed, I mean, uh, we have come a long way since the 1990s, since the establishment of ICTY and ICTR, uh, and, and the International uh, Criminal Court. Uh, the, uh, the gaps, the, the, the failures, uh, and the successes of, of, of um, ICTY and ICTR that were uh, established in, in a sp very specific con con context. I mean, the ICTY uh, was established when, when uh, the, the war was still raging in, 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 in Bosnia. The terms of reference included uh, uh, maintenance of peace, uh, deterrence of future atrocities. When uh, the, the uh, ICTR was, was established, it also uh, added, uh, placed the focus on national reconciliation. It was in a very specific uh, context. I think that the ICTY, ICTY and ICTR, more especially the ICTY, has gone a long way in establishing norms and standards and, and uh, in terms of the uh, focus uh, that they have placed on the prosecution of sexual violence uh, cases. Uh, 
and, and taking uh, conflict-related sexual violence out of the, out of the shadows, uh, I think they have come a long way. They, the, the, uh, these two courts were the basis uh, during the discussion leading to the International Criminal Court. Uh, today, uh, again, we see that the International Criminal Court uh, has not been spared of, of, of the criticism. There are many criticism, but I think we also have to, uh, to understand that uh, the uh, international criminal justice system as it stands today, which is one side of the coin, with its strengths and its weaknesses, the other side of the coin cannot be impunity. Right, uh, that is not an option. Uh, to that extent, uh, I think we have to uh, to continue building on on what we have, and and to also understand the constraint uh, of the ICC that that include uh, a limited mandate to a certain extent, uh, the political dynamics, uh, the constraints that come. Uh, in terms of having uh, three permanent members of the Security Council not a party to the ICC, and and uh, and how difficult it can it can be to to get referrals from the uh, from the ICC uh, from the Security Council to the ICC, and Syria is a, is a, is, a, is a concrete case, uh, despite having tried uh, several times. Uh, there there are budgetary constraints. But at the same time, we have to realize that uh, not impunity will. Uh, we, we, we cannot. We cannot uh, simply put the burden on uh, the ICC uh, and, and on a single institution. And we have to to understand that the ICC uh, has contributed significantly in in uh, in being a role model for national institutions. And I can give you. A very concrete example, I did the commission of the International Commission of Inquiry in Guinea-Conakry in 2009 and after I completed my, <coughs> my assignment, the report uh, was presented to the, uh, uh, to the Secretary uh, uh, General. In the recommendations, we included uh, 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 involvement of the ICC, that uh, we, we, we made very specific recommendations in terms of what should be the role of the, of the ICC, but Guinea was, is a party to the, uh, to the Rome Statute. And there, there have been uh, preliminary investigations promptly con conducted by the ICC. But the, uh, although Guinea is uh, a party to, uh, to the Rome Statute, the, the court remains uh, a, a court of last resort. It's only when a state is unwilling or, uh, or is incapable of, of uh, uh, delivering justice at national level that the, the uh, jurisdiction of the ICC is triggered. And in that, in that particular case, uh, the uh, the pressure placed by the ICC through the preliminary investigation was, was very instrumental because uh, it led to, uh, it, it, it really jump-started uh, efforts to build national capacity. And uh, my office, uh, the team of experts has provided a lot of technical support uh, to Guinea. And today we have 17 indictments of very high officials, I mean the ministers uh, uh, we, whom we, we, we found were, were, were guilty of, of uh, uh, crimes against humanity, as well as the former president, Addis Kamara, and, and, and uh, the uh, prosecutions are about to, uh, to, to start. It's a, it's a question of, a, it's a matter of months now, uh, but there has been a lot of technical support uh, uh, by by my office and other stakeholders, other stakeholders have supported Guinea in building its its national jurisdiction, and I think the ICC should uh, should be encouraged to to be that role model for national institutions and the many ICC stakeholders 
uh, have uh, are, are now placing uh, focusing a lot of effort on on building uh, reinforcing national jurisdiction uh, and I think it's a it's a good thing right I mean like uh, I myself, I come from, uh, I have a civil society background. I mean, like, uh, I, I am a product of, uh, of, of civil society. I, uh, for me, the, uh, the, the input of uh, civil society is invaluable to this work. I cannot do this work alone. Uh, and I'm even trying to, uh, to have an advisory board because I really value the work. Of, and that will include, uh, civil society organizations uh, uh, <coughs> across the world, including in countries like, like Norway, uh, with a government that is uh, a strong supporter of the mandate, uh, but also gr local grassroots uh, organizations. So what I'm trying to establish is like a database of local grassroots organization in, 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 in the 20 or so countries that I'm engaged uh, in. Uh, but also having a broader uh, constituency of, of NGOs working on issues of uh, conflict-related sexual violence, but also broader issues of, of women, peace and, and security. For me, it's, it's critical uh, that there is that constant engagement. But in, in addition to civil society organizations, I also want to, uh, to, to reinforce uh, the collaboration of my office with, with academia and, and research institutes because there are knowledge gaps. Uh, and, and, and I think it's critical that, uh, uh, that there is uh, ongoing, ongoing work uh, with uh, uh, we also with academia and research institutes, but for me, civil society organisations like Focus. I mean, like I also I have worked closely with your counterpart in in Sri Lanka, for example, uh, in my former capacity as CEDO, But I continue to to work with Focus because Sri Lanka is uh, is in our annual report for for a number of years. Uh, it's it's absolutely critical. Right. In fact, uh, I, I mentioned Sri Lanka. Uh, in fact, it was it was. Uh, I did the commission of inquiry in two thousand and nine. I think Sri Lanka uh, reported uh, to the committee also in two thousand and nine. And as a CIDO expert, I was like very very distressed when I saw that there was absolutely nothing in the report of Sri Lanka. On, on, on the conflict and the very difficult post-conflict and you will all recall what happened in Sri Lanka in the last phase of, of the conflict and there was absolutely nothing. It was business as, as usual uh, and uh, unfortunately the pre-session working group uh, uh, which prepares a list of questions and issues uh, two sessions before the the state party uh, comes before the, the committee had completely uh, uh, had failed to address uh, uh, that dimension. But fortunately, when uh, when uh, Sri Lanka came for for the examination of its report, I was able to uh, to also brief the committee because I was not, although I was not the country reporter, but I was allowed to uh, before the examination to say, listen, there is a huge gap. Uh, because there's nothing in the report, but the list of issues and questions prepared by five committee members in the pre-session working group had also omitted, and it's a major, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a major problem. But please allow me to really focus on on the post-conflict, on the conflict and the post-conflict. And the government was not expecting that at all because they thought they, I mean, the, the least is to. Their report may be silent, but the list of issues should have addressed these questions. So they were completely taken by surprise. Uh, but I grilled them throughout throughout the, the day. 
And, uh, and when I, uh, that's when I, I presented the report at the same time to the Secretary General, um, who wanted to, uh, in, in which the sexual violence uh, was addressed extensively, although there was resistance from the chair of the, uh, uh, of the International Commission of Inquiry, who told me, you know, thousands of people have died, men, women, children, and, you know, 200 women have been raped, so what, you know, and, and uh, let us focus on, on, on the killings. And, and I said, no. Uh, I said, I'm not going to sign the report if we do not, we have the terms of reference and they are comprehensive and they will, sexual violence will be addressed. And I, uh, I mean, like I was working round the clock to meet with survivors of sexual violence, uh, to listen to their stories. In the beginning, it was uh, the men who were coming and they were asking, oh, but you know, we have a neighbor who, uh, who has been raped. How can you help us, a neighbor or a cousin or a niece? Uh, and after half an hour and one hour, then they would, he will, they would actually turn around and say, by the way, it's my daughter or it's my, my wife. And where can we meet? And I even went out of my way, went to, to very secret places to meet with some of them because they were being chased by the army. And that entailed working really around the clock. Uh, and I also was assigned by the Secretary General to go to, uh, to, to Senegal where many had to flee because they were very close to, uh, to the political leaders in the opposition uh, who had uh, organized that, that, uh, that, that political rally. And uh, so when the report came before the Secretary General, he wanted to understand the focus on sexual violence and the way it was addressed. And I, then I explained to him my CEDAW background and how comprehensive CEDAW was. And, 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 and I told him that, that there was a huge gap uh, uh, in terms of uh, states parties understanding the relevance of CEDAW to uh, situations of conflict and post-conflict and that they, they do not see the relevance. And, and, and I expressed the uh, the wish to uh, to be given the opportunity to, uh, to to draft a general recommendation on the role of women in conflict prevention, conflict and post conflict. But I had to discuss it with him because I knew, I knew that it it was not. I I wrote GR 24, uh, 25 on on temporary special measures. I was sitting in Berlin with one colleague and we wrote it in three days in Berlin. And I told him, you know, this is not something that I could uh, draft sitting in my office in Mauritius or on a beach in, in Mauritius, that I need to have regional consultations and I need, I need the, the support. And he immediately phoned Michelle Bashley, who was then the uh, first executive director of UN Women. And I did broad-based regional consultations and, and came up. And in fact, it's... Uh, it's, it's, it, the, the, the value of, of uh, the more I look back, so the, res, the, the GR was adopted in 2013. I did regional consultations everywhere. And uh, basically, we've, we've uh, used a legally binding instrument uh, yeah. to monitor a political uh, instrument, the whole uh, WPS agenda. Uh, starting with Resolution 1325, by asking states parties to report on their on their implementation, uh, and I must say that I, I think I think and and for the first time after usually you wind up the working group once the GR is is adopted, but what we did, uh, I have made that recommendation and it was endorsed by the committees to have uh, a task force. We call it a task force uh, to monitor. Uh, uh, how we we uh, we use uh, that GR30 and, and uh, ensuring that the questions are raised in the list of issues and questions. The task force was uh, responsible to uh, to review the reporting guidelines for states parties uh, to help them to uh, uh, to uh, provide the ne the kind of information that we need in the report. Uh, the task force uh, so keep an eye on, on all the list of issues and questions, making sure that, that we, we get the information. We also drafted, a, with UN Women, a, a user-friendly guide 
on GR30. So my short answer, I'm sorry for the long introduc introduction, but my short answer is that there is a very user-friendly manual prepared by the committee with UN Women. Uh, it's on the website of UN Women uh, on how to use, so it's all about the question of uh, disseminating it. And we have partners like Euro Asia Pacific that, that brings NGOs to the committee and trains them, uh, builds their capacity uh, uh, before they attend a CEDAW session. I mean, like they are, they are using this user-friendly, uh, this guide to GR30 that really uh, uh, helps both NGOs. Um, uh, maybe six, seven years, uh, uh, since six, seven years ago, to, to actually support uh, a number of countries in the, in the elaboration of their national action plan. Uh, I've done it for, for, for Pakistan, for, for Afghanistan, for Iraq, uh, and the last one that I did was Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan this year in April. My last uh, maybe CEDAW assignment was um, I think we've come a long way because if we look, if we compare the, the generations of National Action Plan, uh, I think this new generation of National Action Plan uh, is, is also, and, and, and there is also regional, regional action plans, which is an interesting uh, development. Uh, I think we've we've documented all the, the good uh, the, the good practices and and uh, uh, and the committee continues uh, to to provide technical support in 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 uh, the elaboration of na national action plan, and in fact Norway uh, has a, already has a good action plan. We've I mean, all the components, the monitoring and evaluation, the funding, uh, addressing comprehensively the four pillars and also uh, in terms of addressing the WPS agenda. It, it, it goes beyond 1325, it includes 1820, 1888. Uh, I, have, I have really no, uh, no, no, no advice to, to, to give except that Norway should, uh, should, should uh, uh, help the other countries in, in elaborating their own in addressing the gaps in there, in there, because I have been using certain models, uh, including uh, the, the Norwegian model of national action plan, because when you go into a country, you give a concrete uh, example of a good practice uh, to them, and I have been using uh, the, the, the Norwegian uh, national action plan. And I think yours is like a third or fourth generation. Yeah, so we have a couple. No, that's a very good question because I think uh, that th that that's where the addressing the root cause of the conflict related sexual violence uh, as a priority for for the mandate, as a strategic priority for the for the mandate, helps to have a broader approach and not only to see this mandate as a, as a protection uh, mandate. And, and to bring a broader perspective whilst remaining uh, pragmatic and disciplined and focused uh, with regard to, because obviously you know that when you have a Security Council mandate, you are constantly watched <laughs> by members of the Council. Uh, but I think I have the experience of CEDAW where we have stretched CEDAW uh, to, uh, I won't say it's limit because we continue to stretch CEDAW. It's 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 uh, it's how you make the the, the mandate. You keep the mandate uh, uh, dynamic, uh, just like we've we've made of CEDAW a very living instrument. I think I think uh, my mandate can remain very dynamic and uh, uh, through uh, the prevention. Uh, uh, dimension, uh, which is in line with the vision of the, of the Secretary General. Uh, I think 
we, we can move beyond the protection and address uh, the, the, the other pillars.